Hello everyone and welcome to this, the latest edition of Book Time with Elvis, with me Mark, and welcome to another Saturday assortment. Uh, today is Saturday 22nd of May 2020, in case you didn't know it, and I'll just give you a brief rundown of what I've been up to this week and uh, some upcoming events, uh, the books I've been reading of course, and a continuation of the Mozart Marathon. Um, the week itself has been pretty busy. It's been our first full week back at school, um, you know, since the uh, um, pandemic, which of course is still ang- still ongoing, of course, but uh, they've deemed it safe enough for kids to return to school, so we've had all classes back. And it's been a bit of a shock, of course, you know, having a, a full uh, schedule of lessons again, but it's great as well to see uh, all the kids back at school as well, of course, as all the teachers and and getting on with some normality in terms of lessons. Uh, Of course, it's quite interesting to see how um, the kids have changed over the course of the the lockdown and and, and whatnot, you know, in terms of uh, both, I suppose, physical appearance, but also, um, you know, as an English teacher, how maybe some of them have suffered a bit from lack of uh, normal... um, face-to-face English interaction and proper conversation. So in order to combat this, we came up with a kind of new system at school where we put each uh, child in a pair or in a group of three, and they have to stay now in those uh, groups um, until the end of the school year. And during the course of English conversation lessons, the, uh, the Czech language will be forbidden, and they can only speak English. They will be... Um, given three lives, so to speak, or in baseball parlance, they'll have three strikes and then they're out. Uh, So they will get graded or marked according to how many uh, of these marks they manage to, uh, these lives, sorry, they manage to have intact by the end of each lesson. It sounds harsh, but actually we tried it already during last week and uh, it went down quite well and it was really quite funny as well because uh, I did it... um, in a softer way in one of the younger classes so we tried it in in the third class um so that's children who are about seven or eight years old and of course um the, fir- the third class is when they start to officially learn english though in our school they start right from class one um and of course their english you know is quite um basic in the third class and it was really funny seeing them try to speak only in english and it got to the point where some of them were like um, spouting off random song lyrics <laughs> just to each other. So I'm sitting there and there's this little eight-year-old girl talking to her neighbor and at first it's just a lot of yeses and noes and some other strange things that they learn. And then, you know, amongst the, the, the din, I heard this, this is ground control to Major Tom. And I was thinking, what? Who said that? And then I asked her and I found out that this eight-year-old girl is actually a David Bowie nut. So amazing, isn't it? Pretty cool. Uh, what else? Um, not much else been going on personally this week, I suppose. Uh, I was surprised when I read the news. Uh, <laughs> when I read the news over the last week that Russia published a document or a list of countries it deemed hostile to its interests, and it contained only two names: that of the United States, which perhaps isn't a surprise uh, up against Russia. The other is the Czech Republic, which maybe is a bit more of a surprise. So I suppose we in the Czech Republic are in pretty good company then in that case. So there we go. Anyway, uh, moving on. So some upcoming events that I either have started or would like to join. Uh, I made an announcement earlier on last week uh, of a reading event that I would like to put on. And this reading event will run alongside the Euro 2020, although now 2021, uh, football championship. Um, Please see the video for that if you are interested in joining us. Uh, And I'm thinking I'm going to use a hashtag for that called uh, hashtag Reading Europe 2021. Um, I'm also very interested in joining this ancient athon that I saw discussed on Lukash's channel, uh, A Cruel Reader's Thesis, though it could be quite difficult running alongside the Reading Europe 2021 challenge I want to do, uh, which I have to do now as, I've, uh, as I'm kind of hosting it or starting it. Uh, but the beauty of that is that um, they could probably... Um, be combined really because uh, you know the idea of the Reading Europe uh, 2021 challenge is that you'll be uh, assigned a team 
a, a football team, a country, and you will read books from that country. So if you end up, I guess, with Greece or Italy, then you can certainly easily uh, combine the two. Uh, that's uh, also, I should give a reminder, there will be the draw for the uh, Reading Europe 2021 Challenge that will be held on Sunday the 30th of May. That's where your names will go into a hat along with the names of a country and we will draw out uh, which country's national team you will be assigned and therefore which um, nation's um, literature or books or poems or short stories or whatever that you'll have to read during the course of the competition. Um, I'm not sure yet at the time I'll do the draw. It depends where the majority of the participants are located. So far we have about 10, which actually I'm really pleased with, but it would be super to get a few more because there are 24 countries involved in the competition. So it'd be kind of nice if we could assign uh, everybody a country um, and all countries get assigned. Though I imagine, as as uh, as, as Mark Nash pointed out in the comments uh, of the video um, about the uh, about the announcement for that, that you know whoever draws North Macedonia may have may have the short straw. But who knows? You know, there might be. Uh, I did see actually a list on uh, on Goodreads actually uh, pertaining to Macedonian or North Macedonian um, literature. So who knows? You know, maybe there is enough out there. Anyway, moving on to books, um, maybe Midrash uh, is the event I'm taking part in this month. I have finished uh, Naomi Alderman's The Liar's Gospel, and I really enjoyed it, but I will not talk uh, about it here because I will make a video uh, about that uh, on its own. Uh, the other two books I'm reading, The Nonfictions, um, Delighting in the Trinity and The Unseen Realm, that's a bit slower going, and it's not really anything to do with the... Um, the authors, I mean, they, they make a good um, job at trying to make it interesting. The problem is, you know, I'm, I think because, you know, I, I have my opinion, I tried to set my opinions aside when I went into it, but, you know, it's quite ingrained into me and it's a little bit of a slog, um, you know, when it's supposed to be non-fiction, but of course to your mind it is fiction and you... I don't know, it's difficult to say, I don't want to offend anybody, but of course, you know, I am an atheist, so um, it has been a bit tricky for me trying to read it and actually to hold my interest because all the while I'm thinking, well, yeah, you know, I'm not sure, you know, you have to take that with a pinch of salt and all, oh, yeah, this kind of thing. And there's a lot of repetition, particularly in Delighting the Trinity. It's, uh, it's meant to be like an introduction to Christianity and, um, you know, there's only so much you can write about how... Um, you know, how the Trinity works, yeah, and, and it's kind of repeated quite a lot, but we'll see. I mean, I'll certainly try and get them done. Uh, but uh, but my other read, uh, I'm doing a buddy read with Summer at Cozy Reading with Quaker Cats, enjoying it immensely. Uh, it's going very well, it's great fun. Summer's a fantastic uh, person, really uh, good fun to talk to, very interesting as well. Uh, and I really enjoy our discussions and conversations, whether it's about the book. Um, or just other things in general. And of course, the book we're reading, if you are not familiar uh, with that, is uh, Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. And uh, we both started off not really liking it, um, though I'm ha happy to say it's trundling along nicely now. And we're both over just half, uh, both, bleh, sorry, both just over halfway uh, through that and certainly enjoying it more than when we started. Um, one interesting thing about it uh, from my side was, you know, I went in it completely blind. I didn't even bother reading the introduction or anything. I just started reading the book and I had no idea it was a futurist novel. Um, you know, I knew it was published in 1932 and then some of the things just started not making sense to me, you know, like there's some um, inferences to technology or video uh, telephones or tele, you know, tele, telephones that have video, uh, television screens in them and things like this, uh, as well as um, people making liberal use of aeroplanes and uh, a few other things that I just thought that doesn't seem right, you know. And then after some digging, I found out, yeah, it's a futurist novel um, published in 1932, but set somewhere, uh, sometime rather, in the mid to late 1940s, uh, which for her, of course, would be the near future, but. Um, you know, she's she's kind of already imagining uh, how different it is 
uh, you know, from, from the time she's living in. But they're only really asides. I don't know how much it's important to the main story, but it just kind of made, it gave the whole thing a kind of weirdness that now has been now it's been explained to me. I seem to be enjoying it a bit more. So finally, moving on to the Mozart marathon I'm doing, which of course is listening to a different Mozart opera in order every week. Um, and we come now to uh, Ascanio and Alba, and that's catalogue number K111. And this is a pastoral opera, and it's done in two parts. And um, it's a musical course by Mozart, set to the libretto of uh, Giuseppe Parini. And this was an interesting one because it was actually commissioned by the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria uh, for the wedding of her son, the Archduke uh, Ferdinand Karl, to Maria Beatrice d'Est. That was back in October 1771. Uh, this opera is set in mythical times, and it's the usual format. You know, there's gods and goddesses. Um, there's Venus and um, Ascania, who's the son she had by Aeneas. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, love story with different intrigues and things like this and it's quite fine i'm not going to go into great detail over it it's, as i say it doesn't it was nice but it wasn't um particularly for me it wasn't particularly amazing or breathtaking or anything like that um so there's kind of like you know different characters or some of them have quite similar names so it becomes a bit difficult um but yeah it's the kind of usual thing uh, the, the love story, then they're out of love, back in love, and then um, thankfully due to the shenanigans and workings of, of the gods and goddesses, particularly Venus in this case, um, the two who are meant to be get together, Venus herself retires, and um, Aschiano has to kind of just dedicate the rest of his life to perpetuating um, the race or the, the lineage of Aeneas, um, and... Uh, his the, 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 this new city that was founded, Alba, and guiding that to to prosperity. So there we go. That's my little um, Saturday assortment for this week. Uh, as I said, there will be some new videos to come, uh, particularly in regards to one of the books I finished for maybe Midrash, and maybe some other things. We'll see. So thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and it's a pleasure for me, of course, to see you all again, and look forward to the next time we'll meet. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay healthy. All the best. Bye-bye.